is it good? Okay, um, right. So uh, as Haskell programmers, we're usually very proud of our static types, and quite rightly so. Um, but sometimes we would like to check certain properties dynamically for certain reasons. Um, and this is what this work is all about. So basically we're mixing static and dynamic typing in Haskell for a particular application uh, in information flow control, which is pretty much the same scenario that Alejandro just talked about. This is joint work with Dimitrios from, from Microsoft uh, and Alejandro himself, of course. Um, right, so, uh, so what do we mean by security in this context, by information flow security? Um, so this is a typical program, um, and this is the typical environment around the program, and we, um, we assume that we can partition this environment into a secret and a public part, and, and we usually call the secret part H for high security and, and public part L for low. Um, right, and the program will interact with this environment, performing some effects, reading from and writing to stuff in the, in the environment. Um, and uh, the problem here is to check that the program doesn't ship some information from the secret part of the environment down into the public part. This is the kind of property we want to, to be able to check of our programs. Um, and of course, we're, we're considering this very simple example with just uh, low and high. Um, but in general, uh, this, this actually generalizes to, to an arbitrary lattice. Um, and we, what we have is basically some kind of partial order among, the, uh, among these security labels, such as L and H. Um, so why would we want to do things dynamically? Um, well, consider this function read from URL which uh, takes a string and, and uh, well, which represents some URL and then reads a value from, from that server. Uh, it might be the case that uh, this, this function ends up reading from different servers depending on this string. And, um, and we, so the program can't know um, at compile time what, what, uh, what this server is gonna be and therefore we can't know for sure what kind of uh, label we're gonna have. So basically, sometimes we don't know what part of the environment we're, we're reading from. Um, and, and, and Well, not, not statically, at least. And this is where we might want to do things dynamically. So um, we took as a starting point for this work a particular kind of enforcement called LIO. So um, LIO, in, in LIO, we have um, data sources which are labeled. Um, by, so these labels are basically annotations specifying uh, the, the confidentiality of, of uh, the values in the, in the source. Um, so for this example, it could be just L or H. Um, and uh, an LIO computation keeps as part of its state something called the current label, um, which might change for each, for each step of the computation. Um, and the idea of this current label is that it's an upper bound on all the values that have been currently read up to that point. Um, so, for example, if we have a computation that starts with current label L1 and we read something from label L2, we will update the current label to the least upper bound of L1 and L2, which we uh, write like that with this join operation from, from lattice theory. Um, so this is a read operation. Um, the idea is that by, by using this current label, we can keep track of, of what we've read um, and then potentially prevent write to, to, uh, to, to things that, are, that shouldn't be able to, to get information that is, that is too sensitive for them. So um, this is the write operation. So when we want to write, we have a value in our computation, and we want to write it to some sync, which is also labeled with L3, let's say. Um, and the idea is that in order for, for uh, this write to go through, we have to check that the current label at that time, in this case L, is below the target label L3 um, in this partial order. Um, and this is all we need to actually enforce the, the property I was talking about. Um, of course, we can combine read and write operations arbitrarily. Um, and uh, and this, is a, this is very coarse grained um, and, and it might seem too restrictive. There are ways of making it more expressive, but they're not really important for our purposes. So I'm just going to go with this simplified model here. Um, so, so what we set out to do is to encode this kind of enforcement in, in Haskell's type system. So how do we go about doing that? So this is static LIO. If we have a computation, 
an SLIO computation. Um, we're going to represent it as, well, some indexed type SLIO, um, where we, we explicitly write the initial and final labels, and, and where tau is just the return type of the computation. So SLIO is, is basically monad. Um, and now we need types for the operation. So read will have a type that just takes some source with, with the label L and some value. Um, and, and in the type, we just reflect the fact that the current label will change to the least upper bound of, of the previous label and, and the new label. Um, and for, for write, well, we take um, a value and a sync. And, um, and then we, well, so in the, the, oper the, the computation itself will not change the current label. So we write that as L1 and L1. Um, but we need to check that uh, L1 flows to L, that it's OK to, to write from L1 to L. So we do that using a type class constraint. And here I'm just uh, writing some infix type class, but this, this should be just a two-parameter type class um, that, that encodes this partial order. Um, so um, this, is, this is basically our encoding of static LIO. It requires quite a few things. Um, first of all, we need a type level representation of labels. So what we do is we just define uh, a data type for labels and then promote it using data kinds. Um, so we get a, a new kind called label with, with uh, L and H as members. And we can check that the L, L is a type level expression with kind label. Um, we also need a closed type family to encode the least upper bound function. In, and it has some equations, the expected ones. Um, and we also need a type class that encodes the, the actual partial order. Um, and, the, and the associated instances of the valid flows. So these are basically all possible combinations except for H flowing to L. <clears throat> and, and then we might, we might think we're done, that this is, this is good enough. Um, but um, as we said before, if we have an operation such as read from URL, we run into problems. So static LIO is not enough. Um, and the problem is that if we, were, if we were to find a type for this read from URL operation, um, we, well, so we are going to read from some server, but we don't know what server it is, so we don't know what, what label it's going to have. Um, so we can just represent that as an L star, uh, and then we need to existentially quantify over it. Um, and there's, well, there's lots of ways in which we can encode this in Haskell. That's not really the problem. But the problem is that if we are in, in a context which involves this existential, and then we want to write from this context, we need to prove something, well, a constraint of this form where there's um, a least upper bound operation that involves some, some existential. And the type checker can never discharge this, um, this constraint. Um, so this is the perfect candidate for uh, a dynamic check. So how are we going to do dynamic checks when we have all these uh, type class constraints running around? Well, um, so we introduce a function called din, which takes a value that is constrained by C and, and returns the value, the value without the constraint. Basically, the idea is that uh, din of m behaves just like m except that the t is checked at runtime. So um, the, the, when, when we evaluate din of m, it's going to try and, and build some evidence, build a dictionary for c, and, and fail if, if this is not possible. Um, so this, this, this function might, be, might look a bit tricky. Um, we need to basically define how to, how to defer these constraints for each possible type of constraint we might, we might think of. Uh, and the way we do this is by making this into a type class. So we introduce the class of deferrable constraints, so where C has kind of constraint, um, and, and for which we have to define this din function. Now, how are we going to define din for the particular kind of constraint that we are interested in, in this case, the partial order constraint? Um, so we're going to need a way of connecting the, the types and the terms. And in order to do that, we just use singleton types. So this is a, well, a little digression. So 
So what are singleton types? Um, well, normally we have, this is a very simplified view of types where, where we can think of types as sets of terms um, and we're ignoring undefined values and so on. Um, so we have the world of type, the world of terms, and um, normally what we have is that for every, for every term we can, we can find, find out what its type is. Um, and what we've done here is we've introduced two new type level um, things, uh, two well, labels um, at the type level, L and H. Um, and the interesting thing is that we can, we can introduce terms that correspond to these, to these labels. Um, so we can introduce a term LL that corresponds to low and the term LH that corresponds to, to high. Um, and the interesting thing is that if we think of these as types, the, the arrows go both ways. So not only can we, can, can we find what label corresponds to one of these terms, but we can also go the other way around and find what terms correspond to these type level labels. Um, of course, this is ignoring. So these are called singleton types because they have only one fully defined inhabitant. Um, and the way we encode this is using uh, GADT, which is indexed by a label, by something of kind label, um, and we, which has two constructors, LL and LH, um, with the expected types. Um, so th these are just establishing this connection between uh, the, the world of types and the world of terms. Um, so now we're going to... Um, we're going to go ahead and define an instance of this class deferrable for the, for the type of constraints that we're interested in, in this case, L1 close to L2. Um, so we have to define DIN, which takes an argument M. So remember that M has the type, has a constraint type, so it has some, some type T, and, and it has the L1 close to L2 constraint. Um, so first of all, because of this singleton idea, we can find the corresponding terms for those labels L1 and L2. Of course, here I'm oversimplifying. The way we do this in practice is by having a type class that, that can produce singletons. But, um, so the principle here is that we can, there, there's a way of finding these, these uh, terms. Um, so we call those S1 and S2, and now we can case on them. So remember, these S1 and S2 are, are of this type, S label. They are singletons for labels. And um, so the way, the way, so we, we can now introduce alternatives for this match. So in this case, we're, we're testing if, if we have low and low. Um, so this is, uh, this is basically the case where, where um, a public value is being written to a public uh, output. And, and because S label is a GADT, we're going to have some type refinement here. And, and this is going to unify L1 and L2 with low, with, with capital L. Um, so in this match, we know that L1 and L2 are capital L in this particular branch. Um, so now, here we would like to write just M. Remember that the type checker has these instances. This is what the type checker knows at this point um, about, the, uh, about the flows relation. And we, 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 yeah, we just write M here, and, and this is actually well typed because the type checker finds this instance um, that corresponds to uh, low flowing to low. Um, yeah, so this, this actually works. And um, we can complete the other cases in a similar manner. Note that the last case is actually the case where, um, where, the, where we're having an insecure flow, so uh, something. Uh, which is secret, is being written to a public output. So this should be um, forbidden, and, and we actually have an error there. Um, an interesting thing to, to note here is that if we were to write M instead of that error over there in the last case, it would be a type error. Because in that case, the compiler will, be, will try to find the instance H flows to L, but there is no such instance. So we, we basically can't get it wrong. We can't write M um, in a place where, 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 um, which would lead to an invalid flow. Um, what we can do, of course, is to forget some of these cases. So in that case, we would just be more conservative and rejecting more, more flows than we should. Um, but um, we will never accept an insecure flow. 
So um, using this DIN operation, we basically get the following, um, something we call a hybrid enforcement. So consider just an arbitrary piece of code involving reads and writes. It doesn't matter what it does, but the idea here is that um, you can take your code and just add DIN. Let me highlight it there. So you can always uh, write DIN wherever you want, and this means the following block of code is going to be dynamically checked in its uh, type class constraint. Um, right? So with this, we, we managed to, to build a hybrid version of LIO, <coughs> HLIO. Um, it, it, it's, it features a programmer controlled granularity. So um, that means that, well, the programmer gets to decide what parts of the program are to be statically checked and what parts are to be dynamically checked. Um, it is fully embedded. So we, have, we didn't have to change the compiler at all. Uh, we're just using lots of type hackery, basically. Um, so we, we formalized this uh, as a Lambda calculus to, uh, to prove that we have certain security guarantees. Uh, these are basically the same guarantees uh, from, from uh, LIO. Uh, this is termination insensitive non-interference from, from one of the versions of LIO, at least. Um, and we have this interesting property that, uh, that dynamic checks are sound with respect to the static uh, encoding of, of, the, of the checks um, in the sense that we, uh, um, we, 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 can, we can be more conservative maybe, but we, we would never um, accept a program that is insecure. Um, and in general, in, in general uh, we think this is a, well, a general technique for deferring type class constraints, not just, not just for, for, uh, for the case of, of LIO and security. Uh, so if we, for example, if we have typable as, as, a, as an assumption, and that, well, then we can, we can actually defer equality constraints that are generated by the type checker um, and, and get sort of actual dynamic typing. Um, in, and from the point of view of the user, the, the, um, they don't have to actually know all the details of how this encoding works. They just need to know the API. Um, but they also need to know how to decipher the error messages, which are not so good. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, for example, we might try to run a program with some label, um, and, and we might get something like this, such as, well, false is not true, which, yeah, we knew that, but uh, we would like to know how, how, like, it would be nice to get sort of a trace of what the type checker is doing um, to, to see how it tried to, to prove that. Um, Right, and uh, yeah, so that's basically what I have. So I must say that I actually have, uh, have uh, elided lots of technical details that I don't have time to go into right now. Um, but uh, you're, you're welcome to read the paper if you want to have a look. So um, you might have noticed that there, there are some things that don't completely make sense in the way I've presented it. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I just don't have time to, to go into all the details. Uh, but yeah, do ask questions if you we have them. Uh, thanks. I have a very silly question. Mm. Uh, as a bad user of your library, what's preventing me from adding an instance that yeah. i is lower than low? Yeah, okay, uh, so what we do is basically flow, so the, uh, the, the relation has a superclass constraint, um, has a superclass, sorry, and, and we don't export that superclass, so you can't make new instances okay. of flows. So, yeah, so there's lots of those tricks that, that yeah, I just didn't want to go into. Yeah. <laughs> so it seems that for the code in which you um, establish that these constraints hold, there is actually very little choice. Right? Uh, so you said it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my question is, is there some more wizard level hackery that you can do to automate this? Um, yes, we have considered this briefly. Um, I guess this could be done in some way with, with maybe with template Haskell, I don't know. Um, so the, so uh, this has only has to be written once for every uh, kind of constraint you might be interested in. So it's not that, that big a, a deal, I think. But uh, yeah, but it would be, would be nice to have some, right. some more automation. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, the, the code that you have there um, sort of had to list all the different possibilities of yeah. high and low in the, in the pattern match there. Mm -hmm. does, this, does this scale? Can you do it with more than just two? And, and is there a way of sort of importing yeah. maybe a list of um, uh, levels at runtime or something like that? Yeah, so um, we actually, yes, we did uh, extend it. So actually we implemented something called DC labels, which is another label format, which is more complicated than, than just two, two points. Um, and uh, this, this label format has basically an infinite number of, of, uh, of labels. And the way we do this is we, we encode these with string literals um, and then using the singleton's package, you know. Uh, yeah, so, but it scales. It works. Thanks. I'm afraid we're going to have to take the rest of the questions offline. We're just out of time. <laughs> Let's uh, thank Pablo again. Thank you.